Sophie Roney is our presenter today. So uh, if you're not familiar with Sophie, she is a research park legend and rock star uh, who uh, uh, built up a, an excellent reputation that continues to this day um, in her skills as a tech recruiter. Um, her specialty is an ag tech, but uh, she is no less accomplished helping many companies across the research park, especially startups, uh, to address challenges and really just to help people understand what it takes uh, to recruit top tech talent. And so we are very uh, grateful to have Sophie's level of expertise in our community and to have her share with us with share her wisdom with us today. Uh, we actually have previous uh, presentations that she has done before. So again, if you want to see those, you can see them on our YouTube channel, but that brings us to today. So uh, Sophie, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. That was a very kind introduction. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. And this is in some ways a follow-up to the presentation that I did a little over a year ago at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as the whole country was going into the lockdowns, there was a lot of uncertainty around what would happen as it came to the economy, but also the general talent economy. So this presentation is very much a follow-up to that. And if you'd like to see that presentation, as Laura said, that one is uh, recorded and available. So the tech talent wars, where are we now, now that we're about a year and a half post um, some of the first waves of the lockdown? And what has that done with the talent community specific to the tech industry? So at the beginning, or about a year and a half ago, we didn't know where the power was going to shift. And my take, based off of my research and my experience as a recruiter in Champaign-Urbana, but also nationally, is that the power has completely shifted back to the candidate. So we saw in, we saw in February 2020 that the national unemployment was around 3.5%. And then COVID hit and we saw unemployment hit 10 and upwards, 10% and upwards. But now we're back down and I'll give you the specifics, but now we're back down greatly shifting the power dynamics into the realm of the candidate as the supply of technical talent is not as great as the demand for companies for technical talent. So in terms of how we'll look at this, we'll look at it in terms of workforce, supply and demand. Another large characteristic that has changed in terms of the workforce is the degree of flexibility that is being provided or seeked in a now in corporations, but also by talent. And then how to compensate. Compensation is becoming very tricky and changing very quickly as well. And then lastly, how do you compete based off of these kind of ever evolving three categories of supply and demand, workplace flexibility, and then compensation. So here is an overall graph of, um, of sectors that have also those that have um, stayed the same. And you'll see the most important thing in terms of this audience is where does the tech industry and or software development lie here? And you'll see that since the beginning of the pandemic in February, that has increased demand for software engineers and software development by 53%. And then even more recently, still an increase at 11%. So we're focusing on the tech industry, but it's also interesting to notice what other industries are on here and how that would affect your overall hiring strategy as well. And so this is this is an interesting graph to get a lay of the land of what's happened overall across every industry. And then again, here we see a similar trend where pre-COVID in February 2020, there was, a, we had a very healthy talent economy and job economy. And then we saw the huge dip as soon as lockdown, lockdowns started. But now we're all the way 
back up even past where we were COVID in terms of national job posting. So more and more companies are seeking talent in terms of the demand, uh, up 36% from March and then up still prior to any of the lockdowns. And um, if you want some interesting examples, you can click the link at the bottom for layoffs.fyi. And you'll see plenty of examples of companies that had huge layoffs, Airbnb and DoorDash and Groupon, Yelp, TripAdvisor, and where these companies are now. Not only have they brought back the quantity that they laid off, but they're actually increasing their, their headcount. So here's a few numbers. These are all from the, um, the BLS.gov. So if you haven't gone there, they have wonderful reports on a monthly basis. And um, this gives you just more information in terms of what does the demand look like from a national perspective for technical talent. As you can see, tech overall has added 80,000 workers since or post COVID, so in 2021. And then Alphabet, which you know is Google's parent company, follows that trend with, with 4,000 employees. And then the main thing to notice here on the slide is that we're reaching a different dynamic in terms of the recruiting and hiring and competitive industry where you're not just competing with people in Illinois or in central Illinois. Now you can look at LinkedIn and you can even look at people's profiles and you'll see that some of them increasingly are changing from local companies to national companies as your location is no longer a top factor in terms of where you'll get hired. And so as we all know, Champaign-Urbana has always been a great place to find technical talent and more and more companies know that. There's a top university, there's a lot of top, com top companies. And so they're not just hiring nationally or they're not just hiring in their hubs anymore. They're increasingly hiring um, in the South, in central Illinois, um, and all of these places where kind of hidden town talent exists. Um, and another point, this is not just the tech industry. Um, you can see at the bottom that there's other industries that are also increasing this demand for, for technical talent. So don't let this graph scare you too much. Um, this gives you an idea of, um, of salaries in terms of what you can expect if you're in, if you are working for one of the top five technology companies, whether that's Apple or Google and um, or Facebook or Microsoft, Amazon, these are all kind of the top five bubbles. And you might be thinking, how the heck could I ever compare with with these types of salaries? And this isn't this isn't alarming. This is more to give you an idea of, oh, this is how those those companies are compensating. And this is what I would be competing against if I'm also looking for an experienced software engineer that has um, a similar skill set, which a lot of Champaign-Urbana companies and research board companies are. So what can you do if you can't provide these types of these types of salaries, which is it's very unique to be able to compensate that way. And we'll get into that. So in terms of demand, software engineers are at the top in terms of overall demand. On the left hand column, you have month over month increase in demand that we're seeing. And so you'll see some tech talent or some technical roles there in terms of month over month increase. So the, these are new developments over the past couple of months. Product design solutions engineer, um, financial advisor is actually due to an increased an increased amount of um, retirees in that specific sector, if you were to drill down in that number. But the point here is for a, another data point where technical talent, along with some other titles, are in higher demand than ever um, post-COVID. A, a more interesting one here might be animal groomer due to the increase of adoption of pets. Um, but this is still another example of um, that the demand is, is just higher than ever. Okay, 
So what does the supply look like? If we know that the demand is high, which it is, um, what, um, what, what does the supply look like? So this again is, um, is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and uh, it shows the most current unemployment rate for the national is 5.6. That is two points higher or so than it was pre-COVID. So pre-COVID, it was at 3.5% in February, and February 2020. And then if you look specifically for, so the national rate was at 3.5% in February 2020. The circle here at 5.6% is specific to Champaign-Urbana. I apologize, I, mix, I misspoke. So the 5.6% is specific to Champaign-Urbana. And then if you look down for the information sector and technology sector, it's at a low of 1.8% in terms of people that fit this section or this industry. Uh, the unemployment rate is 1.8% specifically to Champaign-Urbana. And this is completely verifiable if you just go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Okay, so this is one of the toughest times to recruit. Um, I'm recruiting every single day specifically for technical talent. And um, so how do you expand your talent pool? And what do you do if you can't, um, when you're trying to compete for similar talent in terms of software engineers? There's a few things. So you can provide an environment that has flex location and flex hours. Now, flex hours means that um, you are offering a full-time position or a part-time position, but they don't have to work the typical nine to five. Maybe they like to work six to eight, uh, be able to be with kids home from school for a few hours during the day and then log in again in the mid-afternoon and at night. So you're still getting in those 40 hours a week but they're more on your own time. So this frees up the talent pool for those with more family care responsibilities and more typically the female employees that we know have dropped out of the workforce as, as COVID-19 began last year. You can also offer part-time and short-term. This allows for those workers that are near the retirement age in their career, that allows for them to take short-term and part-time projects. So this would be great if you're looking for potentially um, an interterm, an interterm accountant or COO or CTO for people that are later in their careers that still want to maintain an active, um, an active working life as they start to as they start to wind down. And then millennials love to be able to be their own boss in terms of create their own schedule, have contract work. And um, so this is where you might look into more freelancers. And then lastly is apprenticeships. So more and more people are converting into the tech industry. There's examples of, um, of waitresses that have decided to take classes in Python and other programming languages that are transitioning into the technology industry and, and, um, and others who were impacted by COVID-19, that CTEC is a very viable option, which it is. And um, so apprenticeships are a great way to bring those people and that talent into your company. A perfect example is the Illinois Research Park Reboot Program, where there's a lot of talented individuals that are coming out of that program on a quarterly basis that, um, that are transitioning into tech and would love to be in a position to have an apprenticeship at a tech company. So where can you find some of these people? There are numerous talent platforms. This is just a list of a few of them that a lot of companies are using. So there's highly skilled talent platforms in terms of in the left-hand column here where you can find full-time, but also contractors and part-time. And then there's work, there's platforms specifically for freelancers. And this makes it a lot easier to hire for hard to fill roles, decreasing your time to hire, 
It reduces your headcount if you're concerned about increasing your overall payroll on a long-term basis. And it gives you more flexibility depending on what companies might experience next with, um, with any changes to, to the overall economy. The big cons of going this route are uh, employee buy-in. So your current full-time employees might not trust bringing in um, contractors that are doing maybe similar work. So you'll have to think about how to really have employee buy-in if you're looking to get these projects, these high priority projects done. A lot of times it takes work off of their plate. So it's not a bad thing. It helps them be done with work earlier or have less stress. You need to change your infrastructure if you're going to be able to execute upon using some of these talent platforms. For example, your IP. What are you willing to actually share with contractors? Can you create some type of a new solution so that it's plausible to bring short-term or not full-time work in? You'll have to come up with ways to specifically measure their success. Are you actually getting a good ROI using one of these platforms? And then likely the hardest part is breaking down vague job descriptions into extremely rigorously defined components. Writing job descriptions is already tough, and um, but breaking them down so that they can be executed upon by somebody that is not in the office on a day-to-day -day basis, or maybe that doesn't have the same access to communication tools that full-time W-2 employees have is is crucial if you are considering going this route to increase what supply you have available to hire. Uh, now, this is not just for starters. This is not for companies that are in the top Fortune 500. Many companies are going this route. Um, so the US Transportation and Security Department used Kaggle recently for a $1.5 million competition. Uh, PGA, the Golf Association, uses Upwork. The uh, Anheuser-Busch uses Catalan. Uh, Prudential Insurance uses Topdol for UX designers. And the United Nation even uses some of these platforms in order to crowdsource sustainability initiative ideas. So this is not a strategy that is reserved for those that can't afford a certain amount or that um, that don't have other avenues or the network, every company is looking at other ways to increase the supply because technical talent just is very high in demand. Okay, so competing and then workplace flexibility. There are a few different models that companies are going with, but it's becoming more and more apparent that you must give your employees an option if you want to remain competitive. It's no longer an option to say that you have to be in the office or provide uh, stringent rules around being on site. Uh, we've seen that companies, so for example, Goldman Sachs tried to do this uh, a month or two ago where they asked or they mandated that employees come into the office and they had people quit left and right across the board. And so they quickly had to change their strategy to have a, to promote work flexibility in terms of location. Some of the things that companies are doing, I'm sure you're all well-versed and researched into this area. One article I do recommend looking at is um, remote worker bias and how to think about that in the context of your company. If you have people in office and then you also have people Remote, um, how do you deal with some of the conflict that is bound to arise there, along with um, the discussion around does one deserve a specific pay premium? Uh, and that will be linked in the presentation after this, that article. So how do you pay? This is another really interesting conversation that's come out of everyone or many companies having a flexible and remote strategy is how do you compensate a remote, a remote workforce or a hybrid workforce? 
So this is from PayScale. And this is, this is a very popular example of you can compensate on the employer's location, the employee's location, or have one rate that works across the board at a national scale so that it doesn't matter if you're on the East Coast, it doesn't matter if you're in the Midwest or the West Coast, there's one standard rate and that employee is free to move across the country as they wish without their pay being changed. Um, Facebook has a very public new policy on how they are going about this that, um, that you can look up. But this is something that you'll have to determine sooner than later in terms of what your, your company strategy is, as that's crucial as well in the recruitment process as you're hiring remote employees. So how do you compensate? Maybe you can't do, you can't come up with the compensation levels that I showed you earlier, but there's plenty of resources free and paid that you can start to dig into. So one of the most interesting ones here that's also maybe the least well-known is h1bdata.info. And this is where companies, any company that is applying for an H1B on behalf of an employee, they have to list their title, their job category, and then their salary with the application. So that's a database of all of those applications that you can look at by company, by region, and it'll give you an idea of how people are compensating. Levels.fyi is also another really good free one. And then Robert Half, which is a global recruitment organization, recruitment agency, they have a fantastic salary report that they put out every single year. And that's where this screenshot is from. It's from Robert Half's uh, website in terms of uh, how they think about compensating various different roles on the technology side and um, how they go about benchmarking depending on your location. So if you can't compensate with straight cash, which very, very, very few companies can, it's, it's almost, um, almost very specific to those top five companies that we all know about. What can you do in order to sell your company and in order to, to attract candidates? You must come up with a employee value proposition, also known as an EVP, if you want to Google it and how to create one. You have to be able to sell your non-monetary advantages. So at the top of every list is, I want to be inspired. I want to have challenging work. I want something that is invigorating mentally for me. So you need to think about that and how you're crafting your job descriptions and how you're reaching out to candidates about one of the top drivers in terms of career changes. How can I be more invigorated at work? Paid time or paid overtime. So even if you're salaried, it's becoming, it's not completely normal, but it's becoming one where you're acknowledged if you were to work over the 40 hours a week. Maybe that's not with, maybe that's not with cash and or or um, or gift cards, but it's acknowledged and you get a day off on a on a Wednesday or you're, that is noted even if you are salaried. And it might seem, um, it might seem obvious for hourly employees. This is becoming more common in the, in the salary world as well. Vacation and PTO, there's a lot of flexibility that you can actually have here. So for example, shutting down during December 23rd through January 3rd is a way that some companies increase the amount of time that candidates have for themselves, for their hobbies, for their families, without it coming out of their PTO. So time is just as valuable as money. And this is another way that you can think about how you can compensate your employees. A profit sharing mechanism. So you don't have to give equity to be able to share the success of your company. So if you had a really good year or a really good quarter, think about ways that your company can maybe implement a way to give back. Um, that wouldn't have happened 
if you didn't have awesome employees. So how can you share the success with them directly? If you can have a really clear plan of a promotion path and raise opportunities, that is a game changer. So very few companies have at the get-go in terms of you're, you're looking at signing an offer with a company or even you're in the interview process. Very, very few companies have a plan laid out for that candidate or it can be specific or general that says, okay, I know that you're here. I know that you're starting as a software engineer. I know that you want to eventually be a technical architect, or I know that your goal is to be a software engineer three. This is exactly how our company will get you to where you want to be. And this is what you can expect along the way. That is, I very, very few companies actually do that. So if you're one that's able to do that and show the, show a plan for somebody and show that you listen to them about what they want out of their career and how you can help them get there, that's a, um, that would be a huge game changer in the interview process. Um, I mentioned apprenticeships, but this is also a way to get diverse, unique, and new technical talent into your company. Flexible work arrangements we discussed, training and continuing education. There's very economical options for this at this point where uh, Udemy and Coursera all exist and they're very affordable. And if you can even carve out time for employees to be able to use them, to have a corporate sponsorship for them, there's, um, there's a lot of awesome, very economical options. And then lastly, parental leave. So it is becoming more and more of the norm, no matter what gender you are, that you receive the same amount of parental leave. So if um, mothers, fathers are equally compensated to be able to spend time with their family. So parental leave is becoming more of the norm versus um, maternity and paternity leave. All right. So... It, this is more of a summary of what I've said so far in terms of competing in a very high demand uh, with a low supply, the competition is inherently higher. So what can you do to recruit, interview, and sell the candidates that you want? So first, you have to have an active recruiting strategy. There's just, there's no way around it. Um, a passive recruiting strategy is when you write a job description, you post it, and you wait for the right person to apply. That just does not work when you have, taking the number from Champaign-Urbana, 1.8% unemployment in the technology industry. There's not a lot of people looking at job boards. So an active recruitment strategy means that you're actively looking for the people that you want, whether that is at meetups or conferences or, um, or events or LinkedIn, you're actively looking for this people, growing your network and pitching them essentially to join your company. That's an active recruitment strategy. In the interview, you must gauge candidates differently. So instead of saying, we want you to have the experience with this exact technical stack, which changes often, First, it's Angular, then it's React. Now it's something else in terms of the frameworks that you must know. Instead of benchmarking candidates against what they must have in a, a quickly changing technology space, you should base them off of their potential and their capacity to learn. Instead of having education requirements, looking for prestige from an education or university, you should be testing their current skill sets. Instead of going through an interview process that is variable, depending on the candidate, you should have a structured interview process where each candidate goes through something, an interview process that's thought out, that has, um, that has a list of questions that help actually determine the success of a hire, and that a way that you can actually benchmark candidates against each other, candidate A, B, and C, that is consistent 
so that you can um, go back and determine what type of an interview process actually yields a successful hire. And then you must compensate competitively. So we discussed that it's hard to come up with the amount of, of dollars that might be on a big tech company's offer letters. But there are other ways that you can sit down with your team to find out what's important to them to be creative. And if not for future recruits, it can be for your current employee base. What is important to you? If we were to give you one more day off a week, if once there is a, when there's a big push for a release, would that be helpful? Um, just asking your current employees, that could help you drastically in retaining them. And then the tech industry no longer sells based off of surface level perks. Uh, it used to be infamous for ping pong table um, and lunches and all of those things are nice. What's most important is your mission and your value. So if you, if you haven't um, come up with effective ways to sell your mission and your company values, that's a great way and um and then lastly well actually back to that um everybody wants to work for or it's it's very rare that someone somebody does does not want to work for a mission driven and um, a company that's actually changing society for the better so if you are it's a huge huge sell and then lastly Every company has customers and you all, you wouldn't be a company if you didn't treat your customers well. So you must be treating candidates like you treat your customers, like you go about outreaching to them and listening to their concerns and integrating their feedback. If you can treat the interview process and the candidates like that, you would have a huge, a huge advantage. So lastly, now that we know more about the supply and demand of the current technical industry and for tech talent, instead of having more of a power position potentially as the company and asking why you want to work for you to answer the question, why should I work for you? Thank you very much. That is it. Um, all of this information, is all the sources for the data presented on today is in the notes for this presentation, which I believe will sent out to anybody that was registered. If you have any questions, you're welcome to email me at the email address here. Thank you very much. So I didn't see any questions in the chat, but I'm curious if anyone wants to go uh, uh, ask questions verbally or put something in the chat. Um, but if not, I will ask you a question, Sophie. So do you have any examples? You don't need to name, um, uh, name a specific company, but um, can you give us, oh, I, I do see uh, one question, so I'll defer to that. Um, before I go to my question. Uh, the question is, salaries are growing because of the tech war. It seems like most tech in engineers, especially the younger ones, are not wanting, are not waiting to follow a promotion plan. The demand is so high that in some cases, people are requiring an immediate promotion recognition. I faced some cases where people were working for the company for only three months and they left because of an opportunity to get more money. What advice can you provide? If that's a trend that you're seeing, um, I would I would start to talk about that trend with candidates earlier on in the process that you could be blunt in terms of this is what we are seeing um, if, and, and ask them uh, what they would do if that situation was presented to them. I would be curious to see how much more they're being offered in terms of um, in terms of salaries and so you said it was three months, three months into the position. That's also, um, that's, that's a kind of a predict predicament if it's new grads specifically, 
as um, new grads are at the beginning of their career. So if this is their first job at a school, they also likely don't understand the maybe some of the ethics around switching a job after you've accepted only three months afterwards. Um, however, I would have those conversations earlier on with candidates at the beginning or when they're signing their offer letter and um, and you could talk to them about about the the climate that's that's actually a really tricky one it's one I would think about more more of maybe a comment or support of um, what was just said um, I just lost a grad that we hired who'd been with us two months who left us to Google for one hundred and forty thousand dollars so in some instances there's no way I'm competing with that um, <laughs> you know I yeah. The, the six-figure salaries that these students are getting fresh out of college is insane. Um, we're really struggling. We wanted to hire 35 uh, graduates, and I think I'm at 22, and I've been at high. I've lost two, that one disappeared after the third day, and we lost him, and one who sent in his resignation at 8 a.m. on his first day. Um, so like my numbers fluctuate, like I think I'm at 24 and then I'm back to 22 and um, we've been at it since March um, and I have yet to be able to get to my 35. So it's, it's the struggle is it's definitely real and hard and war for talent is a very apt <laughs> description of it. It's extremely competitive. Um, are you looking all in the same spot for those 35 people in terms of graduates at U of I? No, we've cast a very wide net. Um, I think we've pulled in maybe five or so from the local market. The rest are people that we have convinced to relocate to the Champaign area. Um, and we've offered relocation assistance uh, for that. We, but we've cast a, an extremely wide net to try to fulfill our needs. So we're also selling champagne um, as an area which is has its challenges over a big city, um, but not knowing is a lot of, of the battle I think that you have to face with some of the graduates. I had a local U of I student who we offered 74 and he said, well, I have an offer from a, a company in San Francisco for 85. And, you know, so, you know, that's $10,000 more. And I said, have you looked at the cost of living in San Francisco? Um, and so like together with him, I did a, a cost comparison of what 85,000 in San Francisco was versus 74,000 in Champaign. And he ended up taking our offer, but like those things don't always enter into their minds. Um, so there's a lot of salesmanship that's going into this a whole new world for sure it is um and those those calculators i used to do that for champagne urbana and compete for talent for the west coast as well and so those calculators are definitely helpful to send to candidates so that they can realize the the true value or the net value of an offer and i'm assuming that your company needs people that are on site we do. We're in a hybrid mode with, um, we'd like to get to three days in the office, two days at home. Um, we're still yeah. on a voluntary basis though. Um, but yes, we do want them in person. So there's, you know, that we're not willing to be 100% remote, um, especially with graduates. So right. lots of things that others are able to offer with the flexibility and those things that we aren't necessarily able to be quite as competitive with. Right. This is Bill, this is Bill Dick from Illinois Rockstar. And like Amanda's point, we've had some issue, not issues really over the last year. We've actually added 15 engineers over the last year. Uh, when, when you come back to your, was COVID good or bad? It was very good for us. Uh, we'd like to think it wasn't, but it actually was. Um, and most of our engineers are fresh out. And Amanda, you're describing yours as being largely fresh out as well. 
And so they stay for a while, but we've come to understand that our average tenure is going to be less than two years. In fact, over the last 10, it's been 1.9 years, and it didn't matter at all the group that's in in in-house right now or anywhere else. We're up to 32 engineers, but the average tenure is still 1.9. And so we're looking at people who are young, who don't stay very long, and yet we've been able to attract them from elsewhere. But again, your point, Amanda, I think is really well taken. We lost an engineer two months ago to a financial firm in Manhattan, and he left here and took a $100,000 salary increment. And you can't get a 23-year-old engineer to stay anywhere if you're going to increase their salary by 100000 to go to New York. And it doesn't matter really what the cost of living is. That's just a really big number. Yeah. Yeah. Sophie, do you have any, do you have any sense about the youth of employees? You know, the fact that, that ours are really young to begin with, not just because we're in Champaign, but because it's a very high-tech area and a very te- high-tech uh, uh, business. Do we know anything about that? So the average tenure at, um, at Apple, for example, is 1.8 years. And so I'm doing that- great. Yeah, you're killing it. <laughs> uh, which it, it sucks if you're if you're an employer to have those types of tenures. That's a lot of information lost on a very regular basis. Um, so when I was recruiting in Champaign Urbana, and then I left and went to Silicon Valley, uh, I I was recruiting there, and I wanted to turn down people that had such short tenures at these past companies, but it was just the norm. And, uh, and my boss in San Francisco said, you know, that's, that's the norm here. That's just what you can expect. And we have to adapt in terms of, um, in terms of allowing people to use us as a stepping stone. That's what she said. And, um, and there's some truth to that. Um, it's also extremely frustrating to have people that only stick around for so long. There's retention strategies that you can build into your compensation program. If, um, if you're, if that's a possibility, the cons to that in terms of golden handcuffs are that uh, maybe you have people there because they want to get the, they want to put in the time to get the full vest of whatever their lure is. And, um, and then that affects your culture. If you have people that are just there because they have golden handcuffs, not because they want to be. Uh, so what is, is an overall reflection of the technology industry spreading out from the Bay Area and into the Midwest and affecting how technical talent, especially, especially from a campus where they've been being recruited by some of these top companies and all of their peers, many of their peers are going to some of these top companies as well. We tried the golden handcuff thing twice. Did you? They, liter- they literally left the day after the contract ended. What, whatever the, the handcuff was, they literally left the day after. They told us two weeks in advance of the end of their two week term and they were gone. It made no difference. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> in one case, I was happy to see this person go. In the other case, I was not. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's, that's very, upfront and bold. Um, it was pretty harsh. Yeah. Yeah. That What's is- your point about your point about being a stepping stone is something that we recognize at Illinois Rockstar. And it's something that we have now built into actually built into our plans rather than trying to run around. In terms of let us help you get to where you want to be mm-hmm. in exchange for these two years. Right. That we know you're going to, st- that you are not going to stay with us for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. When I was 20, when I was 22, I was looking for a company where I could stay for essentially my entire career. That didn't happen either. Uh, But that's not what, that's not what I see today. It's not, and not even a little bit. (laughs) Not even a little bit. No. Uh, 
Sophie, we had a question about um, if there's, if you're seeing any, or if there are any, if you have any information about trends regarding um, if there's a norm for days of the week for hybrid employment for tech employees, like if there's a standard, if there is a hybrid situation, is that standardized at all? Or is that very specific to different companies? I think it's specific with a few guidelines. So if you have certain groups that work face-to-face -face or that need to collaborate together. So for example, you have product management and engineering. Product management and engineering should be in at the same time versus um, versus maybe sales and HR are then in at, at the same time. So of course, groups that, that work together outside of Oh, sorry, there's one more. So many people also want that if they have a commute, they want the more extended weekend. So they want to be in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, not in the office Monday and Friday so that they have that extra time. But I think it's all still shaking itself out and specific to your employee base, how far they're coming from and, um, and how many actually work work face-to-face -to -face together in cohorts. There is a, um, there is a website called like the work from home research center, which has come up over the past year, which I'll link to as well, or I can send Kathy a, a follow-up email with just loads of links that you can look into. And there is a, a new institute called, I'm, I'm butchering it a little bit, but, um, called the Work From Home Research Center, where I pulled some of this information from. Great, thank you. I don't think I see any other questions and we're about 10 minutes before the hour, but um, as we said, we will send out, once we have um, the presentation, um, we will send that out. It will take us a little bit longer to get this up online as uh, we are, as our, student intern team, like many of yours, has gone back to classes and we don't have them as much. So we will get this up as soon as we can, but it will certainly not be instantaneously, but um, hopefully we will get Sophie's deck and can share that out um, very uh, efficiently. So thank you so much for your time, Sophie. Thanks to everyone who spent their lunch hour with us. Um, if you are part of the research park and need our help, you know where to find us, please reach out and we'd love to work with you. So thanks everyone for your time and good luck. Take care, everyone.